Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. Well, you've no doubt heard the phrase, and maybe the song, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But then again, doesn't Scripture say, let the weak say, I am strong? I mean, what if our idea of strength is all wrong? And what if there's a different way and a better way to frame our trials so that we can better find our way through them? Author and counselor Andy Kolber, I love that name, by the way, joins me today to talk about how to find the path of healing and wholeness through our story. We'll draw from her book, Strong Like Water. Isn't that a great title? Finding Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. Let me tell you about her. We'll get her on the show. Andi Kolber's a licensed professional counselor, author of the critically acclaimed book, Try Softer. She's received additional training in her specialization of trauma and body-centered therapies and is passionate about the integration of faith and psychology. Andi speaks regularly at local and national events, and she has appeared on many podcasts. As a survivor of trauma, Andi brings hard-won knowledge about the work of change, the power of redemption, and the beauty of experiencing God with us in our pain. I love your bio. I just love you already. Andi, so (laughs) great to meet you. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, this conversation is a long time coming because I've been hearing so many people talk about your work, and I'm so grateful God has just established you in ministry for such a time as this. And Andi, we've got amazing listeners. We've been at this for quite a long time, and every day I ask the same question, and I love the question, and it's, you know, what what has God been impressing upon your heart? And what I love mm-hmm. about that question is that He invites us into His presence. He wants to hear what's on our heart, but He also has some things on His heart to impart to us. And as you spend time with him, what's he been impressing upon your heart? Mm, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, a a verse that has been coming to me often lately, um, even just today, as I was, I was working on some, um, some things and spending some time with the Lord and it's Romans 8, 38 um, and 39. And, and that is for, I am convinced that neither life nor death neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, This verse, it's one I think probably people have heard a lot. You know, it's a pretty popular verse, but I think for me, one of the things I love about it, um, especially I think as a therapist, one of the things I hear in that writing is this profoundly secure attachment with God, like this way that God um, moves towards us and is with us. And that's just such this mark, I think, of who God is. You know, sometimes I think we get things mixed up. We feel like we need to impress God. We need to do all these things to keep God with us. And it's like this verse is saying, no, 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 I I am coming for you. I'm with you. There's nothing that will stop that um, as as we're able to receive that, you know. So I think for me, it's just this beautiful reminder. Um, In a way, it goes to some of the work that I've done around Try Softer even is like, you know, we can soften in to the presence of God. We don't have to try so hard. We can receive what is there that God is with us. And, and so this is just this verse that, um, yeah, I think Mm -hmm. there's been almost like a renewal of this verse and the preciousness of it for me lately. That's so beautiful. What I like to say is when it comes to you and your story, God is indifferent about nothing. He's passionate. He's purposeful. He's meticulous. And when I hear 
people say, God doesn't care where you live or where you work. Just do those things as unto him. I I think to myself, I could not disagree with you more because he delights Mm -hmm. in every detail of our lives. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's a force, isn't he? I mean, he he loves us. He's not shrugging his shoulders. I mean, my boys are grown now, but never once did they ask me, can I go to the park or go to Joe's house? And I said, I don't care. Never once. Because I care about everything about their lives and how much more so with God, right? Mm, yes. Yes. Mm. I would love a little backstory on your journey, Andy, and, and what made you, um, what really marked your life in such a way that brought you even to where you are today? Mm. Yeah. Well, it's a complicated story for sure. But I mean, it is one that I just feel profoundly grateful for. Um, just God's continued kindness in my life. But um, what I would say is that, you know, I grew up um, in a family where paradoxically, I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of love in many respects, um, but there was also a lot of trauma. Um, You know, one of my parents was particularly particularly abusive and I had, and there was, you know, mental health issues and um, addiction. And so as I think is true for anybody, that's confusing, right? Like to have things like love and pain so connected. Um, And so part of my journey, um, you know, in my childhood was I learned to adapt to that type of environment by working really hard. Um, I learned to be impressive, you know, as much as I could be. Um, And it was a way that it helped me navigate what I was facing. Um, And so I think for me, I, that even though, you know, I experienced God at a really young age, um, but I can look back now and see that it was hard for me to fully um, rest in and experience God fully because so many of my, you know, my experiences with my caregivers um, were fairly traumatic. And so I, I share that to say that, you know, as I continued to grow and develop and um, I ended up going to grad school to become a therapist. And in that process began to untangle some of these you know, like some of the things that I thought were just normal for people, I began to realize, oh, no, no, that is actually, that's trauma. And in that process began to see and untangle where God had always been present with me and being able to see a more clear view of God's witness, even as I began to experience a more clear path towards healing. Um, And so, you know, part of my journey, I've been a therapist for almost 20 years at this point. Um, it, it's been an interesting road. I feel so grateful for the journey I've been able to be on. And even as a therapist in that 20 years, um, part of what began to happen at first, a lot of my work was around talk therapy, which can be really helpful. Um, but what I found also in my own journey and my clients is that oftentimes, talk could only get us so far. And that's where I really began to do some deep dives into understanding more about like our neurobiology, our nervous system, how trauma gets stored in our body, how sometimes, you know, we have a disconnection between what we sort of know cognitively and what we experience in our body. And that for me has been a key component of my work is often with followers of Jesus, helping them to figure out um, how to work with the gap that they experience between who, you know, they know that God loves them. They know that God is good and faithful, but not always experiencing that reality in their body, in their lives. And obviously all of us have our own story. So I always want to be careful about how I talk about someone else's story but often that can be connected to things like our nervous system and experiences of trauma um, in our stories. And so all of that work <laughs> has led me to be with you today. Wow. What a, what a beautiful way of putting that. And, um, you know, I think, friends, as you listen, you maybe relate because there are things that you say, oh, yeah, yeah, I already know that. 
Well, your brain knows it, but your soul doesn't. And there is a massive disconnect, a physiological disconnect, where if you're honest, you can say it doesn't feel true. Okay, I might know that to be true, but it doesn't feel true. And I think that is part of the goal. And we'll talk a little bit later in the show about experiential. I mean, just the importance of experiences that confirm the truths about your life because of who God is. Um, We're going to pause here. When we come back, we're going to talk about how God redefined strength for you, Andi, and uh, how we can embrace our own stories and follow Jesus on the healing path for our own stories. And I forgot to mention Andi's new book, Strong Like Water. We've got a handful of copies to give away. Subtitle again is Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. Also, it's fundraising season, and our fundraiser starts up next week. Would you be praying for us and even be prayerfully considering how you might be involved? We are a listener-supported ministry. We can't do what we do without you, and we absolutely wouldn't want to. And many hands makes light work. Would you prayerfully ask God, how should I sow in and through Faith Radio so the gospel can reach the world? The world's desperate for healing, desperate to know the love of God, and we're desperate to share Him. I pray you consider how you might be involved. You can even start now by texting the word GIVE or give safe and secure online at myfaithradio.com or text the word GIVE to 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry, of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to Andy Kolber. Her brand new book is Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. Got a handful of copies to give away today. Text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. And if you've got questions on how to move through the hard parts of your story, if you feel stuck, you don't know what to do next, go on and text your question in, and I'll do my best to weave it into the conversation. Uh, Natasha texts in from Wisconsin, and she says, what are examples of trauma? What say you, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a great thing to, for us to talk about. And what I would say is I start with defining trauma pretty broadly, and then I will give you some examples. But because um, I, I think for a long time, folks have understood trauma through like, oh, if you're a veteran, you've probably experienced trauma. Or if you went, you had a car accident and you experienced trauma. And that may very well be true. Um, but what I would say is that from a nervous system perspective, um, trauma is anything that overwhelms our nervous system's capacity to cope and process what we've experienced. Now, why that matters and why I start with the definition is because essentially people are going to have different capacities to process different things. Like for example, a kiddo, their nervous system is less developed and potentially more vulnerable, um, particularly if they don't have a supportive caregiver. And so like something that might happen to a kiddo that would be potentially traumatic could be things like being shamed repeatedly, being neglected, um, not, you know, um, definitely experiences where they are terrified of their caregiver or observing experiences of violence. Now, if those things happen without repair, and this is an important piece that maybe Susie will get into as well, but it's the repair piece um, after something overwhelming that has happened where potentially trauma could heal something that has the potential to be traumatic could heal. But if we experience repair afterwards, our body could process it. Now, Mm. for an adult, let's say they um, had had experiences of trauma from their childhood, right? And those weren't results. Let's say they then are in a workplace and environment where uh, they might have a shaming boss, right? They might have an experience that reminds them 
of something from childhood and that has the potential to compound that type of trauma um, or certainly so so these are examples of things i would maybe call um, a lot of these are what i would call little t trauma and what i mean by that is it doesn't necessarily qualify diagnostically for something like PTSD. So typically PTSD is things, you know, like violence, experience, watching someone um, experience, you know, being killed or sexual violence. It could be um, it watching or observing um, shock trauma. Um, all of these things fit into that category of big T trauma. But what I think is really important for listeners to hear is that both big T trauma and little T trauma um, matter. Big T trauma may need uh, more, um, it may impact your life to the point where maybe functioning is more impaired. But when little T trauma is not addressed, those things can add up and actually act in the same way as, as big T trauma. And mm -hmm. so ultimately with little T trauma, again, any experience that overwhelms us so much that essentially we're not able to process it because it was too overwhelming could potentially be traumatic. This is why, you know, I correct me if I'm wrong, but when you think about all the factors going into even a child experiencing something that seemed really benign, like they wake up and everybody's gone and maybe mm -hmm. because the parents are out talking to the neighbors and the kids all went to school, that kind of thing. Um, but they have a brief moment where they feel abandoned or stuck. Now, if a child who lived in a loving home experienced that versus a child who constantly felt abandoned where mm -hmm. they had absent parents, that would bake into their nervous system in a different way, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's really well said because it really is so much. And, uh, you know, I won't go into fully into attachment theory today, um, though I do go into that quite a bit in Strong Like Water. But what you're kind of talking about um, with the, that parental caregiver unit is often related to um, if we feel like we have secure attachment or good enough parenting, basically, with our caregivers. And, um, and that is a buffer for a lot. We can go through a lot of things and that security is essentially a lot of the repair. But mm. in the absence of that, when kiddos, right, with undeveloped nervous systems, uh, you know, with prefrontal cortexes that will not fully form until mid-20s, what happens is, is those types of experiences essentially do not have, um, they, the kids don't have the support that they need so that the nervous system can do what God designed our bodies to do, which is actually to metabolize the pain. And we can metabolize that pain in the presence, ultimately, of love and care. Wow. Uh, Natasha's follow-up question, wouldn't any kind of horror or sin be scary to watch on TV? And could the shaming boss also not be shameful? Those are two separate questions. But watching traumatic images, I mean, talk about that because it is amazing where entertainment and video games have gone and what kind of input that is to your brain. And again, friends, hear this, the, the background of of what kind of support system. I even think, you know, what you're inheriting. I mean, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lee Warren, who joins us every month, says you can be born afraid of things you've never experienced because of trauma that your parents have experienced because of the epigenetic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, flow down, basically. So all of that to say, though, say a word, if you would, about some of the yeah. stuff you see on TV or in movies and the impact on our brain and our nervous system. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we absolutely like our, we have something in our body um, called our mirror neurons. And, and that's truly directly related to our sight, you know? So, and this has a great function because essentially it helps us, especially developmentally, um, learn, we kind of learn about the world and our through our caregivers and we mirror back to each other. You've probably experienced this with other people, you know, where you mirror each other. But what also happens, this is also the basis of empathy, essentially. So when we observe someone going through something violent or horrific or traumatic, um, it absolutely has the potential. And hear me say the potential, right? Because a lot of this is less about it's a sure thing. It's more about the recognition. This is disturbing. 
this is too much. Um, if we can notice that, we can potentially get more resources around us, like even turning the channel, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, reaching out to someone, uh, listening to maybe our body, you know, if something feels overwhelming or suffocating, or there's so many different things physically, somatically, there are things we can do to help our body process that so it doesn't become trauma. But what I, what I do want to acknowledge is the reality that when we are constantly, like I can say, I, I have a, I like, I'm a highly sensitive person. So I try to be pretty aware of what I watch. Um, and I try to be aware of imagery. And I do that not because I want to be disconnected from reality. In fact, I, I very much want to be able to honor reality. But I see it as I'm the steward of my body and my nervous system. And when something, if I know it's going to be um, potentially harmful, it doesn't do like that's not ultimately helpful if it's going to traumatize me <laughs> right. to, to observe something, right? It actually mm -hmm. might make me less effective, less helpful, ultimately even maybe less compassionate and empathetic because if my nervous system begins to respond, for example, from a stress or trauma response. So yeah, it puts you, put you, put you into self-preservation then. So you can't have compassion and empathy when you're trying to save yourself, which, that's you right. know, when you get into self-preservation, that's what you're doing. Wow. That's right. You know, yeah. She made a really good point too, and it's separate, but I feel like it's worth mentioning. When you have unresolved trauma, um, even parts of your story that it'd be easy to minimize, maybe a teacher embarrassed you in front of the class when you were in fifth grade and you think... Ugh, it's nothing compared to, you know, sexual abuse or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not dealing with that, you know, she's like, could could it be that the shaming boss is really not shameful? I mean, there are times when you might be picking up on something that is not accurate because of unresolved trauma. Isn't that right? Yes. Yep. And I, I think this is a really important piece and, and something I actually go into often in my work. Um, and here's how, what I would say is that any time that our nervous system is experiencing a reaction to something, um, we can honor the reality that something is happening. Like, let's just start there. Like we, there is, I call it activation. I use the word activation. Essentially, that's like there's potentially a threat response beginning to occur in our body. Now, here's what we don't always know. Is this a, only about the present? Is it only about the past or is it a combination of both, right? So oftentimes in, in the journey of healing, part of what actually begins to happen is our nervous system gets more finely tuned, basically, like an instrument, right? Like when an instrument gets really out of tune, um, you might not be able to tell what song is being played because it's not as effective, right? And our nervous system, when we have a lot of unresolved trauma, essentially what can happen is we can sort of misfire. We can experience a present moment as being unsafe when in reality it may be safe. Or another option is we could experience the present moment as though it's really unsafe and maybe it's only a little bit unsafe. And by that I mean it's it's the type of situation that when we're connected perhaps to our adult self, when our full brain and body is available to us um, because we are in something that's called our window of tolerance, which I'll just briefly define. Um, that's this range of arousal in which we can feel our feelings. And it's and essentially like parts of our nervous system, like our prefrontal cortex stays online. And because those things are happening, um, if we're able to come from like our adult self and deal with our boss from that, maybe this, this boss is um, not nearly the same as your parent, but maybe you're picking something up from them and that's still a reality. And if you can stay connected to this truth of like, 
you know, it's okay to maybe self-advocate or maybe say, you know, thank you so much for asking me that question. I, I actually need to finish this project, but I will get right back to you. Whatever, you know, those different ways that we feel like we have more options, that when we are in more of a trauma response, we don't always feel like we have that. Hmm. This is so good. You said this as you, after your own therapy and the work you put into your healing journey, you're able to say, now I know what it's like to feel safe in my body. Now I know in the deepest parts of myself that I'm beloved of God, the God of the universe. Now I know how to find the people who make me feel like myself. Now I can honor the generational stories that help shape my family. Now I know it's okay, beautiful, really, to feel my emotions. Now I know how to move through pain rather than suppress it or be toppled by it. Now I know what it's like to feel a solid sense of myself rather than constantly react to fear or trauma. I, a friend listening today, you might think, how will I ever get there? But you can. As you follow the Lord, He will lead you. And I think help with a good therapist is always a good option. Andy's book, Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. To me, this is therapy in a book as well. Andy, I'd love to know just in your own journey, you know, you, you really applied yourself to your healing journey. Was there, when you think of the different phases and practices that you applied in your life, was there something you can point to that says that really was the turning point for me where I actually learned to be comfortable in my own skin and not to be afraid of the trauma or the emotions that were associated with it? Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, I have several moments that come come to mind, but I, I will I won't go through all of them. I think one experience that was really um, important for me is first. Well, I'll share two briefly, and one is that you know when I was younger, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and um, in my early twenties, I moved out to Colorado um, after a pretty tumultuous season, um, and and really experienced. Um, God with me in that space. Like I just knew I was supposed to move there. And, and I say that from a place of like, that's not something that always constantly happens in my life, um, especially in that season of my life. But I knew deep in my bones, like that's where I was supposed to be. And so I made this move, um, you know, I drove halfway across the country, like by myself in my little white Corolla, I could packed, you know, bear, what, as much as I could into that car. And, and then, you know, a couple years later, I, um, and in that process, I met my husband, Brendan. And one of the reasons I want to highlight that is not that it always has to come through a romantic partner, but something that shifted for me was the realization that I had almost never experienced ongoing safety, like relationally with anyone in my life. And it was really the development of a really safe relationship that begin, began to soften things in me that allowed grief to be more available um, that because it was as that softening happened that I was no longer having to, to work so hard, you know, in, in Tri Softer, mm -hmm. I call it white knuckling and strong like water. I talk about having to be so very strong. And what is so ironic and interesting is that it was and is and continues to be love and safety and care that made it possible to have the courage to access the pain. Amen. And in doing that, that, yeah, it makes me a little bit emotional just to name that, like, um, it takes so much courage to do that, but that changed me and th and that that safety and and I even for listeners what I would say is wherever we you know we can experience that safety with God and we can experience safety with safe people sometimes we experience God through people's presence with us in our pain you know and seeing that that's God's heart towards us that can be part of the repair and so there were so so many there have been so many moments of God's faithfulness to me. But that is a season in which that changed the absolute trajectory of my life. Yeah. It is amazing how love with skin on, safety with skin on, 
you know, Dr. Kurt Thompson, when he comes on the show, says it's the person who says, I'm not leaving the room. You know, when the messiest parts of your story show, I'm not leaving the room. It is amazing how that heals. And uh, that's why we've got to be those people to each other. I'm so convinced that so much of our healing happens in community. And even for us introverts, and Andi, I'm much like you, I'm a very sensitive spirit for sure. And I just yet sense God's care and his gentleness and the way he leads us to that healing path. We're going to pause here. When we come back, we're going to talk about redefining strength and that whole idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, God won't give you more than you can handle. Quit complaining. It could be worse. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. What do we do with those statements when we're walking through pain? Uh, Andy says there is a little element of truth in these but it's so much more, and we need to know about that. Andy Colbert's my guest. Her book, Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. I often ask this when I have my conferences and in my books as well, to just have you sit with the Lord, close your eyes, and say, Lord, give me a picture of what a more healthy, healed me might look like a year from now. Give me a vision of what that might look like. Now show me how to get there. Show me my next steps. I dare you to do that and ask the Lord for a vision, a fresh vision of what a more healed and healthy you might look like. We'll be back in a minute. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to Andy Kolber. I just love this gal. She's an author. She's a licensed counselor. Her book, Strong Like Water, is phenomenal. Finding the freedom, safety, and compassion to move through hard things and experience true flourishing. And just talking about the idea that we need to redefine and maybe reframe what strong actually looks like. And you reference these phrases that we've all heard when we've walked through hard things. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. God won't give you more than you can handle. Quit your complaining, it could be worse. That, that one's never helpful. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And you say, that said, there are elements of truth in these statements. When the going gets tough, the tough do get going. And faith and prayer are great resources to get through difficult circumstances. Certainly, sometimes there's no other way to survive than white-knuckle our way through life when the circumstances require it. And yet, and yet, when the mm. idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger plays out in real life— we see that it just doesn't hold up. What doesn't kill us can actually make us isolated, traumatized, and deeply harmed if we don't receive the support we need to go through it. Unpack that a bit more, if you would, Andy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for reading that. Um, this, Yeah, this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and I think in part, you know, as I've shared some of my story, I grew up being and identifying as one of what would be seen as one of the strong ones. You know, even though I am a sensitive person, um, I had a lot of armor. I developed a lot of armor in my childhood um, to not need um, much from anyone. I learn. I found ways to essentially combat, you know, all those things we were just talking about. Like if the going gets tough and the, then the tough gets going, like then I was going to be the one who was getting going, you know, even if that meant disconnecting from my body, disconnecting or dissociating or whatever that looked like. And so I share that to say, you know, I think so often in our culture, um, we have this viewpoint of strength that I think is, in a sense, there is truth to the reality that sometimes we have no option. Like I can say that in my childhood, I didn't have any other option. And in one respect of the word strength, I was strong. But what I would say is that I believe God designed us for so much more than just surviving. Like we can honor the need to survive. And, you know, in Strong Like Water, I, I sort of lay out my, it's my best attempt to create a theory of strength that says, you know what, sometimes if we're in a life or death situation, we need to access what I call situational strength. And that's like exactly like the things we've just been naming. It's like we just do the best we can. Um, you know, I talked about the prefrontal cortex earlier. Part of what happens is, you know, that goes offline. Our survival brain comes into play and we just do um, whatever the default in our body to survive. Like we will do that thing. And that what is a shame, I think, sometimes is that in our in our culture, even in Christian culture, we haven't allowed that 
definition of strength to get more expansive. And we almost celebrate when people um, harm themselves in order to quote unquote be strong. And so my hope in the book is to actually to say, okay, yep, there are times that needs to happen. But what about if we also begin to realize how our bodies operate, how our nervous systems operate? When we do that, we see that there's maybe a like a more expansive definition of strength. And what I would say is that the ability to face and move through hard things, including things like trauma, now that is strength. That is a that is a very wide and deep and expansive definition. And in order to do that, and this is the thing that so often I think people aren't comfortable with, or maybe they've never had the support to do, we often need to do things like learn to feel our feelings. And we need to remember that God designed our bodies with so much wisdom, with so much elegance. And if we can tap into this inherent wisdom that God gifted us as we heal, there is, I think, so much potential for us to say, you know, we can honor our survival and also hope and desire and want for more, not only for others, but also for ourselves. Like we are deserving and and God's heart towards us is so kind. And so we can partner with God in the process of, I think, becoming most truly strong. So good. As you're talking, you know who I was thinking about is Simone Biles in the 2020 Olympics. Mm. And people judged her when she, and if you haven't watched any videos, friends, of Simone Biles, gold medal gymnast, she's the GOAT. I mean, that's what they say, greatest <laughs> of all time. She gets higher than all the men in her tumbling passes, 12 feet in the air. I mean, and she's four feet tall. Yep. Try to imagine that. She's, and so she had it, just a feeling in her physiology she wasn't ready. She's like, something bad's going to happen. She just said, I wasn't right. And she and people criticized her so deeply, but mm. she's the one who's putting her body in these positions where she could die or break her neck if she's not mentally ready. It doesn't matter. She's physically trained. And then she came back four years later and knocked it out of the park and was absolutely amazing. But people can judge all they want. They don't have to walk in her shoes. And I think it takes a whole lot of courage to say, I that it's not right for me right now, you know? Yeah. Oh, I love that example. And as I was, you know, we watched the Olympics um, and and watched it with my kiddos and just, and, and the gymnastics portion. And I just, um, even four years ago, I remember when she chose to step back and I remember thinking, um, wow, what strength that is, mm -hmm. what strength that is to honor your limits to know um, to that if something is going to harm you, then it's too far, right? Mm. And part and 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 what um, a beautiful like I love to see how this story has played out because in so many ways she is the embodiment of strong like water because what yeah. she has done at, it was listen to her body, body honor her limits, listen to her physiology, and in doing that. That actually allowed her to more fully become, more fully inhabit who she is made to be, um, probably in ways that may not have even been possible for her um, mm -hmm. if she had not made that brave choice at the last Olympics. Which shows you that we do have to break free from the fear of man. On one hand, we need community. But on the other hand, the gap between uh, you know our relationship with our body and with the Lord be, and what outsiders have to say about it has to widen because if people don't have your best interest in heart and they're just priding themselves in their assessments of you, somehow, some way, if we really want to be healed whole and free, they ha their opinions have to mean a little bit less, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I absolutely think that journey of being able to develop that distress tolerance of knowing that in the journey of healing, we almost certainly are going to disappoint people. Like mm -hmm. I can almost guarantee it. 
And, you know, Jesus talks about that the path is narrow, right? Like, like, and, and in a way that there's this way in which, um, that it doesn't mean that there won't be people that are for us. It doesn't mean that there aren't people that love us, but I think that we get more clarity around that. And sometimes people even have really good intentions, but still being able to have the clarity to hear God's voice to discern with wisdom. And I think a lot of that's happening in the spiritual realm. And just like Jesus lived in a body, we live in bodies. And part of that is that as we do this work of honoring our bodies, it oftentimes helps us, um, I think, better, you know, coming from that place where we're in our window of tolerance um, is often the place where I think we have the best capacity to really hear from God. Because a lot of the noise of the survival brain and our survival strategies isn't so loud. And so I think in that journey, um, you know, I think there's grief sometimes to people maybe not getting where God is taking us and God, you know, invites us to be able to grieve, but also become more and more free to more fully follow in the steps that he has for us. Oh my, so good. We're going to pause here. When we come back, we'll just have a few minutes left. And I, I'm i praying you'll come back, Andy, because I've, I've got way more notes than we have time. So there's so much more to talk about. But in the little bit of time we have left, I want you to talk about the nervous system, how our bodies mm-hmm. hold on to these things and how we can know when our body is trying to tell us something. And we'll expand a little bit on that window of tolerance. And then Lord willing, when you come back, we'll really do a deep dive into that because there's so much to know. There are people that are hyper vigilant. And you think you're being super responsible. Maybe you are, but maybe it's because you're afraid and you're stuck in fight Mm -hmm. flight and you're trying to ensure your own safety. Uh, There's so much to know about who we are and God is leading us and he's moving at the pace of grace. Andy Kolber's our guest. Her book, Strong Like Water. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. You know, there's a truth that daily takes my breath away, and it's this. God wants an intimate relationship with us. He wants to hear from me. He wants to hear from you. And he moves when we pray. We make prayer a high priority at Faith Radio. We pray about everything. As Scripture says, we love to pray for people. We love to pray for you. If you've got burdens you're carrying, we don't want you to carry those alone. Share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio team by texting or calling 877-933-2484. Or you can share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio staff and listeners at MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in today. Susie Larson here on Susie Larson Live. Our guest is licensed counselor, author, speaker, Andy Kolber. Wow, this has been a powerful conversation. Her new book, Strong Like Water, Finding the Freedom, Safety, and Compassion to Move Through Hard Things and Experience True Flourishing. Flourishing is possible for you no matter what you've been through. You follow, if you follow Jesus, you follow a healer, and there is a path of life for you. And uh, may the Lord bring you the right people, the right community the right help and the right support at the right time. And uh, you've got a chapter, Andy, titled The Nervous System, The Sacred Roadmap of Our Bodies. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you've learned about the nervous system. Yes. Well, this is a topic dear to my heart and uh, I'll try to do it. I'll try to do it justice. But I think one of the things that um, to me, I think of the nervous system for each person, a little bit like um, giving people the keys to their own car, right? Like we Mm -hmm. each sort of have our own car and and a lot of us are never taught about it. And so having these basic ideas, I think can be so helpful. And I like to go through the lens of talking about that window of tolerance to unpack it because I think it is a fairly accessible way to discuss it. And so like we already touched base on the window of tolerance coined by Dr. Dan Siegel is a range of arousal in which we can have, you know, an experience or feel our feelings or remember something or even have a sensation in our body. And when we are in that window, you know, this is where we're most feeling like ourselves. And it's also, I think, where we're able to be pro-social and we're able to learn and we're able to just 
um, be most effectively who God made us to be living in alignment with ourselves and our values and who, and God, you know, but when our body perceives that there is a certain level of threat. Now it's important to understand that word perception, because again, it goes to this could be real, or it could also be influenced by the past. But if we perceive a certain level of threat, our body will typically go up into what is called our sympathetic nervous system. And that sympathetic nervous system is marked by mobilization. And the mobilization that can come through different ways, it could be fight or flight. Sometimes it's fawning, which does look oftentimes a little bit like people pleasing or over accommodating. And all of those things, the goal is to neutralize the threat. Now, if we can't do that, our body will drop down into something um, called dorsal vagal. And dorsal vagal is where we begin to go into something that can feel a little bit more like immobilization, um, that we might feel disconnected from ourselves. We might feel um, heavy or maybe even depressed. We might have low energy. Um, we, in a really extreme situations where the threat is really significant, we may even lose consciousness. Now, what's important to understand about when we leave that window of tolerance, what is happening proportionally and at the same time is that the, the blood flow to that prefrontal cortex is going away. It's going offline. And what that means is that we are truly living from survival. We are sort of going to these places where we begin to um, act instantaneously and sometimes even subconsciously. Um, similar to like if you're trying to cross the street and a car almost, and a car, you know, is going by fast and you, you step back really fast. That is your nervous system cueing you to, you know, uh, cortisol and adrenaline um, causes you to step back without even having a conscious thought. That in many ways is how trauma and stress responses work in our body. And so when these things happen, this is a really key point, is that if there is a return to safety, and I go really deep into that in Strong Like Water, what does it look like to have cues of safety? If that happens we may be able to metabolize the experience and it won't become trauma. But if we have an experience that overwhelms our nervous system and we are outside of our window, and again, there's no repair, there's not enough safety, the repair does not match the rupture, this is where trauma may occur. And so, so much of our work and so much of this is learning to understand that God is the author of who we are. And just like you said, Susie, God is the author of healing. And that there are so many pathways to healing. And so when we understand that God um, is the author of love and safety and goodness too, and there's lots of pathways back to places where we are able to ultimately metabolize pain and really live into the person that God made us to be. And I think this nervous system lens really matters. Boy, that's so good. How do we get into a place of repair where you're not having to call your counselor every time something traumatic happens? I mean, what are some things at home if you've been doing the work of healing? Now, I'll give you an example. We just have a minute left, but my listeners know this part of my story, but when I was 10 years old, walking home from school, I was jumped by some big teenage boys. I was, you know, four feet tall. I was beaten to a pulp. They kicked and punched and pulled fistfuls of hair out and pummeled me. I was so traumatized by it. And even to this day, I've done a ton of work around it. But if I see accidentally a clip on Twitter uh, of a beating, it sends a visceral neurological surge through my body. I, I hate that. I mean, it's like an involuntary, like it takes me a bit to come down from something like that. And I'm super self-aware and God-aware, but I think mm -hmm. of people who ha like have a surge of something like that. What would be some wise steps to take to, to have a repair that matches the rupture, as you say? Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to honor is that the more complex the rupture, the more complicated or complex the healing will be. And there is no shame in that. Just I just want to name that. Mm. And there are tangible things we can do immediately. 
And one of the things that I would say that is almost always a good idea is that as if we if we can notice that we are beginning to shoot out of that window of tolerance, right? Because sometimes it happens so quickly that we're all the way out of the window and we we don't have the self-awareness. And that's where we may need like another safe person to be with us. And that happens and that's okay. But we can develop the self-awareness to be like, oh, I'm beginning to leave my window, right? This is where something that is called orienting can be really helpful because essentially we, what we're... Uh, Andy, I'm so sorry. We are absolutely out of time. Please, will you oh. come back and can we pick this I up? I absolutely will. I absolutely oh, will. Oh my goodness. I just treasure the gift of God in you. Thank you for pouring your heart out to our listeners. I wish you could see the text line. I think, friends, you've got some hope today. There's hope for you. Bless you, Andy. Bless you, dear listener, for tuning in today. We love and appreciate you. We're in this together. Hey, we'll leave that drawing open for a little bit longer. Check out Andy's book, Strong Like Water, and we will meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.